So I'm wondering if you ever find yourself asking the question, God, do you really care about my life? Do you ever find yourself asking, God, do you really care about the struggles that I'm going through in my life? God, do you care about my happiness? God, do you care if I'm successful? God, do you care if I'm prosperous in life? I want us to know that God's great desire is that you would thrive in your life and in your faith. That you wouldn't just get by, that you wouldn't just, you know, barely survive, so to speak, but that your faith would flourish, that your faith would prosper. That's what we've been talking about in this series that we're wrapping up today, that our life will be better and we will be better at life. We will thrive when we put into practice these principles, these values, these priorities that we've been talking about in this series. If you missed any part of the series, I'd encourage you to go back and watch and listen or even go back and watch and listen even if you've been a part of it. Today, we are looking at our final value principle idea of, you, of a way in which you and I can thrive in our faith, and that is those of us who will thrive are ones who live a Jesus-centered life. It's really a good culmination of what we've been talking about. You will thrive when you live a Jesus-centered life, and that is shown, it's reflected in the direction you take in your life. It shows in the decisions that you make in your life. Those who thrive in life and in faith, they read God's word, they apply God's word as they follow the example of Jesus who didn't seek his own will but sought the will of his heavenly father. We will thrive when we say yes. Everybody say yes. Yes. When we say yes to God's will and God's way in every aspect of of our lives, when we will thrive when we live a Jesus-centered life, and that is shown in our daily decisions, both big and small. Now, next week is Easter. It's the greatest day in history. But in order for Easter, in order for the resurrection to take place, Jesus needed to say yes. Everybody say yes. yes. Say yes to God's will in God's way. And we see this illustrated in what we refer to as the triumphal entry of Jesus, which took place one week before the resurrection. We also call this day Palm Sunday, which is today, Palm Sunday. But for the triumphal, but before the triumphal entry of Jesus, before Palm Sunday, before his entry into Jerusalem, Palm Sunday actually had to have its origin all the way back in Luke chapter 9. We're going to look at a few passages, verses there in Luke chapter 9. And in Luke chapter 9, it tells us this, verse, chapter 9, excuse me, Luke chapter 9, verse 51. It says this, As the time approached for Jesus to be taken up to heaven, he resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Some translations say this, He set his face for Jerusalem. You see, Jesus had been sent on a mission for the, by the Father. But like you and I, Jesus had to make a decision on whether or not he would carry out his purpose. He would carry out his mission. Whether or not his direction, whether or not his decisions would actually reflect the will of the Father. We get a glimpse into what his decision is in verse 51 when Jesus set his face towards Jerusalem. In other words, he was saying, yes. God, I say yes to your will, to your way, to your direction. And Jerusalem is where his mission would culminate. Now, let's think about those disciples for a moment. They are so excited about for this moment. They are pumped to finally go to Jerusalem. They've believed that Jesus is their long-awaited Messiah that they've longed for. And so they've longed for him, and so they're ready to, you know, kind of get this party rolling, so to speak. Jerusalem, here we come. It's time to conquer. But for, for Jesus, Jerusalem meant something different than it did, than it meant for the disciples. For Jesus, it meant death. That was God's will. That was God's mission. He had to die in order to conquer. And it was now God's timing for him to pr- fulfill his purposes, for him to fulfill the mission. We fast forward to Luke chapter 18, and it says this. Jesus took the 12 aside and told them, We're going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written by the prophets, and in other words, everything that's in the Word of God, everything that's written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. And what is that? Jesus goes on and says, he'll be delivered over to the Gentiles. They will mock him. They will insult him and spit on him. 
They will flog him with a whip and kill him. On the third day, he will rise again. You see, the word of God was clear as to what needed to happen. And Jesus, just like you and I, had to make a decision. What am I going to do? Am I going to say yes to God's will and God's way with the direction I take my life? Or, like us, we have a decision to make. Am I going to try to do it my way? Am I going to try to do it according to my will? You see, just like us, Jesus had to decide, will I follow the Scripture or am I going to ignore it? Am I going to do what God's Word wants me to do or am I going to ignore God's Word in my life? Jesus chose in this instance to set his face to Jerusalem. He was saying yes to what God wanted for him, what God wanted to do in him, and what God wanted to do through him. And so that meant embracing everything that would come. And you and I know what that was. We know that that would be the denial by his friend Peter. It would be the betrayal by his friend Judas. It would include the abandonment by his apostles or his followers. He knew it would be embracing physical pain, the vicious whippings and beatings, the spitting, the mocking, the pulling of his beard. It would include then the crucifixion. And that would take every ounce of strength that Jesus had to endure, and even then he would succumb to its intended result. Jesus chose to say yes to God's will and God's way, so he set his face to Jerusalem. What happens next? Go back to Luke chapter 9, verse 52. It says, Jesus sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was headed for Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven and destroy him? Brothers James and John, who Jesus referred to as the sons of thunder, you can get a glimpse of that why. They were basically saying, hey, Jesus, we know we're on our way to Jerusalem. We're on our way to victory. Nothing's going to stop us now. Let's let the fire fall. Let the judgment begin right here with those who are rejecting you. Let it be a lesson to everybody as we head to Jerusalem to build our own army and to conquer our oppressors. Jesus, again, had a decision to make. Would he choose the route of what his followers wanted? Would he choose their way of going about God's will? Or would he choose to still stick with what the prophets say, what the Word of God says, and still say yes to the Father? What does Jesus decide? Luke chapter 9, verse 55. But Jesus turned to them, and he rebuked them. So what do we discover here in this passage as as Jesus is making his journey to the cross? What does this mean for you and I? Well, think about this. If Jesus chose to ignore God's will, if he chose to execute judgment, to take uh, take up an earthly rule, if you will, then of course it would make sense for the sons of thunder to, to begin the judgment upon those who wouldn't believe in Jesus as the Savior. But if Jesus chose a different way, not the path of his followers, but to chose the path of his heavenly Father, if he chose to say yes to God's will, then judgment wasn't the way. Why? Because God sent Jesus to save. And so Jesus rebukes his followers' notion of judgment upon others, punishing them with judgment. And in the rebuke of Jesus' followers, you and I discover our role and our responsibility towards an unbelieving planet. In fact, the the entire New Testament is clear. Jesus came to live a life of sacrifice. Jesus came to live a life of sacrifice and service for those who don't deserve it. And so if you, if I, if we want to thrive in our faith, and that happens as Jesus is our our example, our motto, we live a Jesus-centered life, that means that you and I too will live a life of sacrifice and service, that we give up our rights for the benefit of others. In fact, Scripture points to this in multiple places. Let me just point out a couple couple of verses here. Luke chapter 9, it says in verse 23, Jesus says, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up. Everybody say the phrase, give up. 
you must give up what? Your own way. Take up your cross daily and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up, everybody say give up. If you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. So what does it look like to give up our own way? What does it look like to give up our own life? One aspect, according to Titus chapter 2, says this. God's saving kindness, or some translations say God's saving grace, has appeared for the benefit of all people. It trains us to avoid. Everybody say avoid. To avoid what? To avoid ungodly lives that are filled with worldly desires. Why? So that we can live self-controlled, moral, and godly lives in this present world. And when you and I choose say yes to God's will and God's way, when we do that, when we avoid ungodly and worldly desires, when we live with self-control and live with a moral compass and we live a godly life, I want you to notice what Scripture says will happen to us. 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says that everybody who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. That's what's in store for those who say yes to God's will and God's way. So when Jesus set his face to to Jerusalem, to the cross, so to speak, he was setting an example for us to follow. So if you want to thrive in your life, if you want to thrive in your faith, then these passages are saying we give up our own way to follow Jesus. We take up our cross daily. Galatians 2.20 says we are crucified with Christ. And we choose to say yes to God by living a godly life, saying no to worldly desires. And yes, when we take that path, that means at times we will suffer persecution because of our beliefs. Why? Well, God's word tells us. It tells us that those who are in the darkness, they hate the light. They hate goodness. And I think we're seeing more and more of that hatred play out in our country as we move further and further away from God as a nation. God set his, or excuse me, Jesus set his face towards Jerusalem. Once he arrives to the outskirts of Jerusalem, once again, Jesus is faced with a decision he has to make. Does he truly, really proceed with God's way? Or does he change course? Does he really say yes to God. He could pull the plug right here. He doesn't have to go through with this. And that's often how it works for you and I. You see, saying yes to God isn't a one-time, yes, I say yes to your will and your way. Okay, God, I'm good. It's a series of choices that you make each and every day that you say yes to God. And so here he is uh, about to enter Jerusalem, and he has to decide again, I've set my face to Jerusalem. I know what the Scripture says is going to happen. What am I now going to do? Am I actually going to follow through with this? God's will was that Jesus would be the final Passover lamb, the lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. And so God's will, God's way, was that Jesus would enter Jerusalem on a very specific Sunday, which is the beginning of the Passover week. Christians, we call this Sunday Palm Sunday. Today, it's Palm Sunday. In fact, Christians call the entire week leading up to the crucifixion and resurrection, we call it Holy Week, or we call it the Passion of Jesus. Why do we call it the Passion? Well, Passio is the Latin word of the Greek word Pasco, which means the suffering. So we call it the suffering of Christ, the Passion of Christ. So there he is on the outskirts of Jerusalem. What does he say? What does he do? Well, he sets in motion his yes to God's will with these specific instructions to his disciples. He says in Matthew 21 to his disciples, go to the village ahead of you. Because again, they're just on the outskirts of Jerusalem. And at once you're going to find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them, bring them to me. Matthew 21 verse 7, they brought the donkey and the colt to him, threw their garments over the colt, and he sat on it. Now, there's two questions here. First of all, why was this God's will and God's way that he would choose to sit on a donkey? And then secondly, 
Why would he have to come to Jerusalem out of all times? Why would he have to come to Jerusalem on the Sunday before Passover? Well, let me give you a little background for this. The Sunday before Passover was called Lamb Selection Day. It's the, in the Jewish calendar, it's the 10th of Nisan. And on this day, the lambs that they were intended to be sacrificed in the temple for Passover, this is the day that they were actually escorted or brought into the city. And now this is based on God's instructions all the way, going all the way back to the first Passover that happened in Egypt when God had commanded the Jewish people to take a lamb bring it into their homes, and inspect that lamb for four days. Make sure that it was spotless, that it was without blemish. And then if so, they were to sacrifice that lamb on the 14th day of Nisan, which would be the first day of Passover. You could go back into Exodus chapter 12 and learn a little bit more about this. And so Jesus is riding into uh, Jerusalem on the 10th of Nisan, on Lamb Selection Day, where he will now be inspected to see if he is without blemish over the next four days. By the way, you can fast forward. And as you look at the story, and we know the story, they found Jesus to be spotless, to be uh, blameless, without blemish. Pilate said in Luke 23, he said, I've examined him thoroughly and find him innocent. The thief on the cross said Jesus did nothing wrong. And as the Passover lambs were being brought into the temple to be slain, our perfect Passover lamb, Jesus, at that time, was being nailed to a wooden cross. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 says it this way, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. And as that last animal, uh, or as that last Passover lamb, was killed by the high priest in the temple, it was at that point that Jesus cried out, it's finished, and he gave up his spirit. But let's go back to the 10th of Nisan, Sunday, Lamb Selection Day. And Jesus, the perfect Passover lamb, he enters Jerusalem along with all the other Passover lambs. Matthew 21 tells us that by riding a donkey into Jerusalem, Jesus was fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah chapter 9 that had been written 575 years earlier. What was that prophecy? It says this, Zechariah 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Now why would they do that? Why would they rejoice? And why would they shout aloud? Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he humbled and mounted on a donkey. Jewish kings riding on donkeys into their coronation, so to speak, it was part of Jewish culture. For example, in 1 Kings chapter 1, it says Solomon rode on David's mule as they led him to Gihon Spring. Zadok the priest brought some olive oil from the sacred tent and poured it on Solomon's head to show that he was now king. And so it was part of their culture. Zechariah chapter 9 also tells us that, that the king, the Messiah, the Savior, came as a righteous king to bring salvation to the people. I want you to think about that, salvation. Salvation for the people. That's what they've longed for. It's just that they wanted a salvation to be saved from their oppressors. The salvation that Jesus came to bring them, it just didn't meet their expectations. You see, Jesus didn't come to save them from the Romans, to conquer the Romans. He didn't come to save them from an, that oppressor. In fact, what did Jesus say in John chapter 18? He said, my kingdom is not of this world. Jesus came to conquer, without a doubt, but he came to conquer something greater. He came to conquer sin and death, to change hearts, to save our souls. Why? Well, because that's was God's will. That was God's path, God's purpose, God's mission, God's way for Jesus. And so Jesus made his decisions to satisfy the will of the Father, and not himself, and not the people, nor the people's expectations. And I just simply ask the question, what about you? What about you? Are you satisfying the will of the Father? Or... Are you 
trying to satisfy your own will, your own desires, your own expectations, or the expectations of others. That's a decision that you and I have to make each and every day in every part of our life. Yes to God's will or yes to my own will. Well, as Jesus makes his way into the city, I want you to notice what the people do. We see in Matthew chapter 21, verse 8, a very large crowd sp- spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees, they were, were palm trees, and spread them on the road. John chapter 12 says, news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem swept through the city. A large crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches and went down the road to meet him. Palm branches, why? Well, palm branches were represented joy and celebration in the Jewish culture. They were a big part of Jewish culture. In fact, when you think about the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot, that happens in the fall, the Feast of Tabernacles also had palm branches and it was a big part of it. And it had messianic overtones that were attached to it. So I want you to think about this for a moment. Here we have for three years, Jesus has been traveling the country. He's healed people. He's fed people. He spoke of the coming kingdom. He has has walked on water. He has um, taken control of nature, so to speak, as he calmed the oceans. He was a miracle man, even raising somebody from the dead. And this particular generation, the generation that Jesus lived within, this was a generation where the people believed the Messiah was showing up in their time. So the people were convinced. All that they'd watched and witnessed and seen and heard, Jesus was their king. He was their Messiah, their Savior, sent by God to liberate them, to set them free from their oppressors, who they thought were the, was the Roman oppressors. And so we here have Jesus and his disciples making their aliyah, going up to Jerusalem. And the celebration gets more and more uh, celebratory, if you will. By the minute, as people are raising their voices with shouts of praise. All four Gospels want to make sure you and I understand what they said. Matthew 21 says it this way. The crowds went ahead of him and those that followed him. And what did they shout? They shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. The son of David. That their Messiah, their King, their Savior would come from the lineage of David. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Just try to imagine a little bit what they must have felt. They believed the Messiah was showing up in their lifetime. And they've watched Jesus. Here it is. He's finally arrived. And now he's here in Jerusalem. So the crowd is shouting, or they're quoting as they shout, uh, Psalm chapter 118, which was one of the best known messianic psalms. Our Messiah has come. He's here. He's finally arrived. Hosanna which means save us. Hosanna, save me. We believe you're the king who will save us from our oppressors. You and I, we know the story, don't we? Jesus didn't meet their expectations of a conquering king. He conquered all right. He conquered sin and death, and he proved it by raising from the dead. That's what next week's all about. But that's not what the vast majority of people expected or, frankly, wanted. They wanted a conquering king of the Romans. They didn't want some suffering servant. Palm Sunday, Lamb Selection Day today, it's a glorious day. Why? It's the day that Jesus' yes to God's will and God's way set in motion what God had predicted in Scripture would happen. Jesus was a conquering king, a.k.a. he was the final sacrificial lamb that would save us from our sins, conquer sin and death. He would be a conquering king, but he would do it God's way as a suffering servant. Why is it that so many believers fail to thrive in their life and in their faith. Why? Well, I would suggest to you part of the reason is we just fail to understand and put into our practice the significance of Palm Sunday. Like the disciples and and, and those, the followers of Jesus and others, 
We want Jesus to be our version of a Savior, to conform to what we want in a God. We want the Scriptures to conform to our worldview, to be uh, compatible with our culture. We want them to conform. We want the scriptures to to be what our will is and what our way is. That's what the people wanted on Palm Sunday. That's what they meant when they shouted, Hosanna, save me. They wanted a savior king on their terms. They truly neglected to understand God's word, thus rejecting it. You know, one of the greatest sins you and I can make is we could read God's, and when we read God's word and we say, I'm reading it, you're like, I know God's word says this, but here's my opinion. I know God's word is clear for me to take this path, but here's how I think I should go about it. Once again, you and I watched this week as tragedy struck in a senseless school shooting. And people, once again, are asking Why is this happening? Why is this happening so much? What's the problem? What is the solution? And whether it's school shootings or political corruption or the lawlessness that grows worse and worse, the moral decay of our country continues to decline at a rapid rate. Why? Why is this happening? We can, I would suggest to you it's because we continue collectively as a nation to move further and further away from God's will and God's way for our personal lives and for our life as a nation. I saw a poll this week that said that 65% of those who live in the United States say that religion slash faith, religion and faith, is not important or relevant at all in their lives. 65%. It's no wonder we continue to reject God's will. We continue to reject God's word more and more and more. We reject morality. We reject basic biblical ideals and values. But God's word is clear. God's word is clear. His ways are clear. And yet we collectively as a nation, we reject God's views. We reject God's views of human sexuality. We reject God's view of marriage. We reject God's view of the sanctity of life. We reject God's values and virtues like the fruit of the Spirit. We reject absolute truth. We reject honesty and integrity. We reject prayer. We as a nation are rejecting God and faith. And the reality is, If we're being real, even in the church, unfortunately, the church today is so biblically illiterate, it's no wonder we're abandoning God's will and God's way for our lives. And subsequently, even in the church, and I say the church collectively, we are creating our own version of God. And what we want God and his laws and his commandments to say rather than what God actually says. I want you to hear this. God wants you to thrive. Man, he really does. He wants you to thrive in your life. And even in the midst of the growing chaos that is around us, you can thrive if you will live a Jesus-centered life. When Jesus is your model and your example, when you do life God's way, not your own way, not culture's way, not society's way, and if Jesus' triumphal entry on Palm Sunday into Jerusalem, if it shows us anything, it shows us the ultimate example of saying yes to God's will and to God's way. And we know the story the passion of the Christ, the suffering of Christ. It's not always easy. The way of God is not always popular. I can guarantee you it's not always in line with culture. But he's God, man, and we're not. So we have to choose. You have to make a decision. Jesus could have reinterpreted God's prophecies. He could have reinterpreted God's word to fit his own opinion, his own agenda, or the agenda of the culture that was around him. He could have disregarded Zechariah and 
got on a horse instead of a donkey. Ah, uh, God's ways are old fashioned. That's how they did it back then with David and stuff. But now, come on, we're more sophisticated than that. We're more intelligent than that. We've had the industrial revolution, the scientific age. We under, you know what? You, 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 if you're going to be a conquering king, you get on a horse. That's what you do. You don't ride some little donkey. He could have embraced the role that people wanted of a conquering king of the oppressors. He could have, they were saying, look, we got to take back our nation. He could have called down angels to save him from his suffering. He could have called out for vengeance and wrath, which certainly would have been warranted, but instead he chose God's direction. He chose God's way, which meant he chose the way of servanthood, of suffering, of giving up his life rather than saving his life. And that, my friends, is your example if you want to thrive in your life. That, my friends, is your example if you want to thrive in your faith. You will thrive when, just like Jesus, you follow the Scriptures. You live sacrificially. You don't take the easy way out. Sometimes it means we take the hard way. It's the way of the cross to live a godly, self-controlled, moral, and upright life. And so as we close, I just want to ask you the question, in what areas of your life are you not currently saying yes to God's will and God's way for your life? I suspect the Holy Spirit speaks to you all the time and you know what it is. What opinions do you have that are not in line with God's will? What actions have you taken that are not God's way for your life? If you're real, you know God's been trying to get your attention for a while, hasn't he? But you've offered him a stubborn no rather than a willing yes. And whether it's justifying the sin, whether it's rationalizing the sin, whether it's refusing to call something that we're doing or the way we're living as sin, even though we know it is sin, in what area of your life do you need to turn to God today, right now, to repent? to say yes to God's will and God's way for your life. Today, Palm Sunday is a great reminder. Just like Jesus had to decide, you must decide whether or not you're gonna say yes to God's will and God's way. What is your answer to your heavenly Father? Let's pray.